Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and right now we must think, think. But Emil's office was a mess. Papers scattered all over the floor, only distinguishable by the different colors of the ink on them. Maps hung from the walls, decorated with X's and check marks, as if he were a pirate hunting for a lost treasure. But Emil wasn't searching for gold pieces or long forgotten jewels. The treasure Emil sought out was worth more than any metal. He was hunting for hope, to which he found absolutely nothing. Remil heaved a large book off the shelf and set it down with a thud. Why had they chosen him for this? He flipped through the pages looking for something, something for his hope. Book number 480 was no different than the last. Remil resigned to his chair and his message his temples, or massaged his temples. Was he really going to find the answer in a book? Which document outlines the difference between helping and hurting? No matter how many times he read over for the plans for the Siberian plan, he couldn't decide what was good or bad, and what should be presented to the Security Council and what shouldn't. Three knocks at the door finally broke the silence. Remil rushed to answer. Before it was Yuri. Before him was Yuri. Holding two cups of coffee, like one I have right next to me. It's midnight, you know. Remil wiped the sleep from his eyes and nodded. Well, let me in. I might be able to help. A long night ahead. Ooh, coffee at midnight? I don't know, man. Like, yeah, I guess what they're doing is right and all. I have had coffee at midnight and 1 a.m. before, but, oh, man, that keeps you up. Ooh. Oh, ooh. Agricultural development? I like that a lot. Reach for the dawn. We disregard... Oh, we dis... Oh. Uh, we disregard the Siberian plan. Oh no. Oh, does that hurt? Um. Disregard it? Reach for the dawn? Ah. Uh, uh, do I want to do that one? Oh no. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to do facilitate rural mechanization. Because we still get agricultural societal development. One of the important features of communal life is self-sufficiency. While this is often not possible, given that the more rural communities simply do not have the skilled labor or industrial facility to produce things like modern electronics or automobiles, we can set these communities up with the means to acquire such items. By facilitating mechanization in the rural areas of the free territory, we can help rural communes outproduce their needs, allowing them to exchange the extra produce and livestock for items the rural population cannot obtain. Not to mention having agricultural surplus will be useful for expanding the population. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we only have an annual deficit of six. Almost 6.66 billion. Wow. Almost that much. Holy cow. So, a couple comments. Uh, someone recommends we try out the Iron Curtain mod. Uh, okay. I, I don't mind doing that. I'd have to, like, look into that a little bit more. I'm totally okay with trying it someday. Just at the time of recording, there's so many mods out. I can't keep up with everything that's happening. Uh, so, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I have been recommended that before. So, I would like to try it out. But... We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Rural connection. So we did everything on the left already. Liberty. All encompassing. I want to wait for that. As much as I want better poverty and agricultural rates, they only slowly improve. We get more civilian infrastructure. Or we get civilian factors and infrastructure. Uh, uh, I don't want to abandon the Siberian plan, though. I really don't. So welcome the rehabilitated. Begin to improve our professionalism. Maintain the flawless legacy. I'd like to do that. A policy of protection. A policy of liberation. Liberation does sound like the way we should go, realistically. Give me your poor? Well, we don't want the poor people. Oh, obviously the communes don't want poor people because we keep trying to raise a poverty rate, but the communes generally keep saying no, so... <laughs> wow. Poverty rate goes down, industrial expertise change goes up, academic change goes up, uh, an eye to the world. It looks like we should do a policy of protection then. Hmm... Let's do maintain a flawless legacy. We cannot abandon our roots. The militia organization that is a black army is one that is and for by the people. We cannot go back upon this legacy now. Abandoning this legacy would mean fundamentally changing th the foundation of our society. Additionally, given that the military is so intertwined with the government, by instituting a top-down structure of organization in the black army, we would be inviting corruption and the threat of coup from the ruling generals in a newly reformed army. For the safety of our anarchic ways of life, despite its faults, we must maintain our election-based military. Cool. Alright, so we got three days left, and then we could do some more stuff here. We did communes, and I love doing the commune things, I really do. But, I still want... Ooh, hold on, when can we prepare for war? I, I still want to improve poverty here. 69, nice. Uh, this stuff is not bad. We're doing this stuff. Uh, I want to do poverty, though, but there's still stuff we can do down here. How much poverty... How fast? 10 a month. We'll get it within three months to improve poverty rate. Which would drastically improve how much money we can get. 20% more? Not bad. For taxable, um, taxable income rate. Income rate factor and taxable population factor. Man, words are hard to use or say. Uh, I want to do this stuff. But to poverty. But civilian factories. Mm, screw it. We're going to do it anyways. 
screw the commune stuff. But, oh, actually, four, okay. Maybe I'll take that back a little bit. Now we have four commune supporting and five opposing it. Let's see, Konsk, request supplies. Sounds good, five are supporting it. I love democracy. This is, look, oh my gosh, this looks so good. Our stockpiles are looking so good. Why are they looking so good? Why? <laughs> Uh, better industrial expertise. If you would like to read about this, please go right ahead. This happens every campaign when we focus on industrial expertise. We get more efficiency, retention rate, a cap, and growth. Not bad. Initiate propaganda campaigns. Well, we don't really need to do that right now. Are we losing war support? Hmm. That's alright, though. Let's see. And we're not making any more divisions for now. I want to like, make some main battle tanks eventually. Really, we don't need that one on. But I guess for now, go to mess some of these guys on. Three, and then... We can't go back to mobile infantry, which is fine. There you go. 20. Because I'm going to make these guys, like, 60 combat. 60 combat with? No. Hopefully not 60 combat with. 40 combat with. So we got the flawless legacy. Let's do lessons from the Liberation War. The wars we fought in our efforts to reunify Russia was not the ones by sheer brute force and manpower like those of Russia has fought in the past, but rather with the cunning and finesse of smart generals and strategic thinking. We can use these reports and plans to draw on the experience of these generals and commanders to continue developing the military doctrines the old Soviet government had begun developing in the Second World War. Additionally, already, we've begun collecting and teaching the strategies used in the previous conf conflicts in our military schools. Yeah, no wonder the debt keeps going up. Eh, it's going down now since we keep building more civilian factories, which is really good. One, two, three, not bad. The People's Militia. Companion Valentiv sloppily scribbled a signature on the last of the heap of papers precariously stacked on the desk. Approvals, denial, supply requests. Valentiv. Valentiv dealt with all of them. Most generals despise the bureaucracy, and to some extent, Valentiv was no different. He stretched an elastic band around the thick bundle of papers and went to toss some into the band his, si his secretary collected at the end of the night, but found it missing. He shrugged, however, whatever. He had to walk past her desk anyways. R rising with a stretch, Valentin snuggled the papers under his ar armpit and exited the room. Right away, he could already hear laughter or laughing. Not uncommon, but certainly not normal for the office. Valentin traveled down the hall to the, to the left. The voices of the lobby became audible. See that? Scar. That's what you get from the multiple campaigns. See? I shot a Red Army guy for the guy from three kilometers away. It was pretty impressive. On the desk leaned a recruit, badgering a very bored and disinterested secretary. It was clear he had been at it for some time, with little fruits for his labor. <laughs> Valentin sundered up and plumped his papers on the counter. Evening companion, I hear you shot a guy from three meters away. The distressed and newbie began to stammer out some explanation, but Valentin only chuckled and held up his hand. No, 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 that's extremely impressive. Why don't you show this fine lady here some of your shooting prowess? Valentin unholstered his pistol and thrust it into the boy's hand. Here, shoot me, point blank. Valentin stared deep into the boy's eyes, his smile, his smile replaced by a scowl. For some time, the boy stood there shaking before dropping the pistol to the ground. Valentin retrieved the weapon and returned it to his belt. That's what I thought. Listen, kid, the army isn't a place to pick up girls. You've got an obligation to defend your commune and nothing else. I was ready to lay down my life for one point, for a point. That's what every man and woman in the black army swears to do. If you can't do that, I advise packing your, your crap and leaving. Valentin nodded to the secretary, readjusting his cap, and briskly walking out the door, leaving the stunned recruit pale as a ghost. A soldier must be devoted to his brothers and nothing else. We get 15,000 manpower. Not bad, not bad. I would like more, but that's not bad. Lessons from the Liberation War after that industrial warfare. Ooh. Cost more money. Reinforce the soldiers. Okay, why not that one? The military machine continues to demand more and more manpower as we spread out across Russia. In order to state this demand, we must boost recruitment in this newly conquered territories. <clears throat> While volunteers have always been welcome from newly integrated territory, the amount of volunteers joining was always tiny. Simply put, conquered people do not take will to the conquerors, even though we have afforded these people almost complete autonomy. We must begin a mass recruitment drive in the new communes and endear ourselves to the populace with hope we should inc see increased enlistment in the new territories. <clears throat> Let's see. So I did say in the last video that I could do like five, or attempt to do five like uploads a day. Someone did recommend that I, instead of doing that, just live stream sometimes but the problem with me I want I do want to live stream it's just that that means the next day I would have less videos coming out anyways so that's a give and take I suppose convince Tomsk now we already did that so uh, we can only get 0.73 which isn't bad Ooh. but yeah we'll see like the, one of the reasons why I haven't started live streaming yet on this channel at the time of this recording is because I'm actually doing other things on the weekend for uh <clears throat> Other campaigns, we'll put it like that. You give an inch, I'll take a mile. Mr. Renko cupped his face in the palm of boredom. Well, maybe it wasn't boredom, maybe it was disbelief. More than likely a mix of two. He had much better things to do than listen to some hot 
a shot from the big leagues who thinks he's better than any man who's ever served. Mr. Renko has seen the whites of the Nazis' eyes. He's eaten dogs. He saw the brutality of the Nazi war machine. What did Valentiv know? He fought the Finns, the weak and pathetic people they were. Mr. Renko was shaken from their thoughts by Valentiv. Andronia. <clears throat> Are you listening to a word I say? Valentiv snapped, verbally and physically snapping his fingers in the face of the old man to wake him from his daydreaming. Mr. Renko swatted Valentiv's hand from his face. Yes, I've heard all of your speculation and your theories. Your words carry lots of weight while contained in these four corners, but... You have become so out of touch with the field of battle, all you do is speculate in this room. Valentiv, desperately trying to keep his cool, hissed through gritted teeth. I've com committed my entire life to the struggle. We have both watched too many young men die in the chaos of war. I brought you here not to spar with you, Androni, but to lay the groundwork for generations long after us to continue the battle against the state. Valentiv gauged his contemporary's reaction, finding it apparent that he wasn't making any progress. Valentiv, ever the strategist, tried a different approach. Pulling up a chair and sitting in front of him, he met his met eyes to the old man. Neither of us will leave until we solidify a doctrine for warfare going forwards. I will write down on this paper one thing I deem essential, and you will do the same. Once we have our list assembled, <coughs> we can each cross off one of each other's points. Volunteer started, writing down the necessity of it for autonomy of the officers. Mr. Renko eyed the paper with suspicion, but eventually relented, writing down that his claim that air support was a must-have. For the next hour, each man took turns writing down what they seemed, deemed essential for the modern Black Army doctrine until all, as the sun descended under the hills. Two heads, one plan. Not, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Compromising that way. Cool. Uh, at the same time, I would like to make these guys 40 combat with, but right now, I think they're looking okay. Oh, that'll be kind of... How, much, how many tanks do we have? This is really... Not a smart thing to do, but I've done this before. That's actually not bad. 144. Hmm. Because it gives our guys armor, and we just blow over anyone that does not have enough armor. So, hmm, you know what? Why not? Why not? Like the Pokemon. You know, why not? A little crazy, but I like it. Let's see. 11 days left. Cool. Let's see. What do we want? Education. Research facilities, workers, and construction, land reform. I kind of want to do that one as well, because I would love to slightly decrease coring time, because if you keep doing that, it just keeps adding on more and more and more. Ooh, the popularity of the government shall increase. Oh, but 35. I mean, that, that kind of gives you back some political power, so... I mean, then again, I mean, we're already 99% of the way there, so, you know, it is what it is. Compile strategies. Pass it to Chanka. Industrial warfare. Let's do inspire progressive thought, shall we? Control of education is the utmost importance to the security of the free territory. While the military council would like to leave the communes educators to their own devices, it would invite subversion and reactionary ideas to be indoctrinated into our nation's youth. Our anarchism as a whole would be threatened if the military didn't step in and prevent its collapse. The fifth column must be stopped. To that end, we will create an all-encompassing curriculum that will teach both the basic necessities or necessary, basic necessary for the student to function as adults as well as professing the tenets of anarchism. Um, thanks to our greater poverty relief efforts as well as the expansion of our civilian economy, the poverty rate has decreased significantly enough to be noticeable internationally. As the government congratulates itself for its efforts, the first official state projections on the impact of this improved popular prosperity are filed, seeing that the people are able to access superior goods, economic opportunity shall be greatly increased, and our workforce shall be capable of greater and greater feats. A toast for economists? Nice. That's exactly what I wanted. That's exactly, hopefully, what we wanted. So with that, okay, that helps us out a little bit, but not too much more. Not really. 7.4%, not bad. War ain't it all it is cracked up to be. Let's do that one. So, up you go. Call the squad leader, hoisting up the scrawny Stefan onto the back of the vehicle. Stefan scuttled up to the side of the vehicle, trying to get a look over the edges. All he got was a boot to the face. Watch it, barked one of his squad mates, trampling over the recruit as he took a seat. What the heck are you even doing? You look like a turtle on a show with all that gear. What the heck was he doing? The question resonated with Stefan. He was only 17. He never held a gun in his life, and understood next to nothing of tactics by what he lacked in military theory. He made up foreign stories. The boy was in love with the idea of heroism. And what was more heroic than the army? <clears throat> hey, the same squad mate called up. You're going to hump the side of the vehicle. Are you going to... Uh, get over here so the rest of the team can get on. Stefan nodded, lunging from one side of the armored vehicle to the other. The one with the benches. So what are you doing here? The burly man questioned. Well, I, uh... <clears throat> Stefan cleared us up. Well, I just wanted to help out. Yeah, well, you're doing a heck of a job. The seasoned veteran answered. Or sneered. Stefan remained silent, only looking down. Hey, I'm just giving you crap. Where are you from? Novosibirsk. My dad, Stefan, began to get choked up. Well, when the city came under attack, he tried to get the people of his factory to rise up, you know. Fight for something, and they just... They shot him. And then... And then, then and there... The man beside him nodded, understanding his story quite well. Your dad sounds like a brave man, Stefan nodded. The soldier patted him on the back. You seem like a good kid. The man extended his gloved hand. I'm Denovich. I'm here to get you get you the ropes. What the state fears? True camaraderie. Alright, so even though it was going by 10, now it's going up by 5, so I think, I'm not exactly sure, I could be wrong about this, but whatever you get an increase, or maybe, 
and poverty or just like any societal development <clears throat> when you get over to the next hump the next level it goes down by half five a month is still not bad still not bad good let's keep make, working on guns and I would like to cut this down and I would like to do the economy stuff so we can keep working on this even faster uh, yeah let's do that one more monthly population for the next few months it doesn't matter for me too much for that one but whatever <clears throat> Ensure rural interconnection. The rural regions of the free territory that are simply unfit for major industrialization and expansion. These regions are either too isolated or not populous enough, or are in an area vulnerable to foreign invasion. For these areas, the best we can do is extend infrastructure to connect their territories to our own. This can be done in a variety of ways, from building actual roads or railroads, to setting up phone lines or the simpler telegraph lines, to extending the power grid into their territory. This won't provide manufacturing for all these people, but or manufacturing jobs, but it'll hopefully allow them to attain somewhat of a higher living standard. What does the status say? Teaching was a natural calling to Nikolai. Many who were in it for that status or because their fathers had been teachers before them and their fathers before them. In the days of the Tsar, some moaned and groaned as they got the privilege of being forced into it by affluent parents. Imagine that today, a Russian fighting and cursing because he had to get an education. <clears throat> Most would kill a man just to know how to read. That was precisely the reason Nikolai did what he did, because he found people and their unending quest for knowledge fascinating. Even the most brutish black army soldier had her questions, and that's what kept them human, even as it gunned down their enemies. When the general simply made a general call for teachers or for those willing to become them, Nikolai rushed to answer, which was precisely how he ended up in Kansk. The city transformed by, from the beating heart of the territory to just another city. Nikolai found the prospect of the city of the revolution being lost to history a terrifying one, and he noted... He ought to make it one of the main subjects of his daily lesson. Mr. Zoldin, his, pe his pupils cried out as he entered the room. The humble teacher wasted no time getting into the lesson, picking up chalk and drawing a hammer and sickle on the board. The hammer and sickle, the symbol of not only Bukharin, but of Yagoda. Separately, these tools mean nothing but when they are put together, what do they represent? They show the common tools of the worker, united. That This sounds, on the surface level, like something we ought to rally behind. However... Nikolai paused for a dramatic effect, prompting his students to look up from their notes and met eyes with their instructor. Now, this is an example, a prime example, of what we must be most aware of. The state will wear many clothes to try and trick you into being their puppet. There is only one symbol that represents freedom. That is the people hand in hand, nothing else. Teach them well, and all will be well. Hopefully. Let's empower the communes next so we get that extra pee, -pee. And three versus six. Okay, not too bad. Request weapons. They can have guns. Uh, Gorno Altaisk. Political autonomy. Okay, we're going to get somewhere anyway. So we have 5 versus 4. Beautiful. We still have 40 uh, political powers, which means we can spend it on something else. Well, when we get there. Weekly stability. I don't mind that war support one, but I want to keep improving society. Alright, for this one, for 35, that's not too bad. Hold on, so let's do some math. Math sometimes is power here. So for 35 days, 0.35 is how much? 35... 12.25, so really it costs like 21 political power for industrial expertise. Uh, that's not bad. That's even better technically than what you can get up here, even though this does give you extra benefits. So might as well. We'll do it once. Maybe. Probably only once. We'll see. Hey, 6 billion, not bad. How we doing? How we holding? We really need more territories. That's alright. After that, we're going to do this one last. Uh, let's see. Compile the strategies. Despite recent efforts to reform the army and enforce some of the some form of basic military doctrine, many officers end up implementing their own tactics or offensive strategy many times in opposition to what may, might be optimal. We should endeavor to create a unified military doctrine that our officers can follow in order to further whatever grand strategies being implemented during any wars we might be involved with in the future. This will allow to us to get a better understanding of how the war is going as and as to the capabilities of our troops, instead of ho simply hoping that an officer makes the right decision. That could end with deadly consequences. Anything here? No, not really. Uh, construction? I would love to do construction, but that's okay. Convincing? Five? Already good. So, <clears throat> the more PP, the better. The collective? Oh yes. Tom's firearms collective? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, look at that. Much better. While well, the people of Tomsk are well suited to our style of democracy, having already had local democratic structures they could use, they have yet to adopt the gun culture so vital to our defense. People either do not have the interest or the money to purchase weapons, and most do not feel the need to have one, feeling that their armies would protect them. Our presence here indicates that this was obviously not true. Thus, we should create an organization to educate the peoples of Tomsk as to the need and operation of firearms. A two-act play. 
Since when were Stepanov's teeth so white? Had they always been that way? Valentiev couldn't tell. The more he thought on it, had he ever seen Stepanov smile? Surely he have, must have at some point, but as much as Valentiev sifted through all of his memories, he couldn't find the faintest image of Stepanov's teeth. Well, he never needed to need another one. The man was all smiles now as he read over the document. I love this. You two built this? He swung a fat finger between Valentiev and Mishrenko. Mishrenko, the old vain dude he was, jumped to claim the credit. Well, I was drafted by myself. I just had my companion give it his seal of approval because of rank. Stepanov raised an eyebrow looking at Valentiev. That's BS, companion. Alzheimer's has no idea what he's talking about, Valentiev rebutted. Very classy, attack a man for his age. For all his experience, I served valiantly for freedom against a Nazi tyranny. And I do the same today, Ms. Sharenko boasted. Stepanov shook his head and removed his glasses. I don't care who wrote which words. No matter what, here is that. This doctrine is solid. Good work, both or either of you. Mishrenko, his smile pulling up his jowls, proudly walked out of the room. Valentiev shot a confused glance to Stepanov, who simply responded with a shrug. A new doctrine for a new army. Army XP, let's spend it. Oh, did we get the things done? No, we don't. Oh, we did. Nice. Well, that's the case. Repurpose. Oh, that'd be... Oh, that's not bad. That's really not bad. Uh, let's see. Agriculture's not bad. I don't mind doing this one, because even though we get more debt, I don't care. And it uses more civilian factories. We get industrial equipment, which is good. And three more infrastructure, which... Which means we don't have to build the infrastructure and we can focus on other things first as well, so. Which is very, very nice. Alright, let's go with some APCs here. Let's see. Two, two, three. I can add. Look at that. Alright, so these are okay. We'll only make like one at a time because we don't have enough tanks, obviously. Uh, we're going to make these guys 40 combat width. Cool. Yep, boardies are there. Cool. Let's grab that. And we'll slowly start throwing more battalions on there. The Tomsk Firearm Collective sounds really, really nice. We have a total of 27 divisions. Military egalitarianism. Let's do industrial warfare next. The Great War of so many decades past was catastrophic, not only in its casualties, but also in its material consumption. The lesson had been learned by all nations of the world after the war. The development of heavy artillery, tanks, and aeroplanes meant that wars of the future would demand a strong industry to support the militaries of the future. This theory has been proven or proved correct. Our military conquests have only been possible thus far due to the hard workers at home pushing up thousands of guns, artillery, and planes a month after month. Unfortunately, the farther our military ventures out into Russia, the larger our military needs to become to be defend our long borders. Thus, we must expand our military industry to keep pace with our industry. We get four more military factories, which I'm actually okay with. Um, it costs more money, but we really need more factories because we can get more tanks. But really, we could use more fighters first, probably. As much as I want to do tanks, fighters and cast are very, very important. Teaching the teachers, huh? So after... We'll do that one as expertise very soon. It's 67, so we can wait for other stuff. Uh, implementing motion, 11 days. We'll do one and then save some political power for our stuff up here, too. Let's see. Agriculture? Probably agriculture. I like the agriculture too much, probably. Nice. This Pavel held his weapon high above his head, showing it off to the class. It's a gun! The unimpressed room did not stare at me or stare in awe at the weapons as Pavel expected. Not just any weapon, he continued. This is an authentic 1947 Avtomat Kalashnikova, or as you may well very know, an AK-47. Who here knows what the AK... Stood for prior to me saying so. Come on, show of hands. Nearly the entire room of engineers, artists, and scientists begrudgingly raise their hands. Oh, don't lie to me now. There's no way you all know this. Okay, liars, let's break the gun down into its essential compartments or components. The instructor began to disassemble his gun on the table, which is not that hard to do. In the back of the room, the former poet Yaromir nudged the person next to him with his shoulder. Hey, he said, do you have any idea why we're here? The man focused intently on disassembling his gun, ignoring him. Hey, Yaromir nudged him again, this time harder. Just watch what he's doing, this man spat, continuing to tinker with his weapon. Jeez, Yaromir thought. What's wrong with these people? Were they so obsessed with their tools of destruction that they forgot what matters here? Most basic human dec decency? Some, th some, th something washed over him. He must call out this injustice, even if it was small. He rose from his seat and stepped up onto the table. People of Tomsk, lay down your arms. Remember what we stood for. The future. These murder machines are not tools of peace. Rise now. Deny them your hand in the further envelopment of the earth into the war. Yaromir's heavy breathing comprised the only sound in the room. The people of the room looked with him with puzzled stares before praying under their breath that the poor man would just get some help. Uh, <clears throat> where, where, where were we? Funny. Funny like a funny bunny. Cool. Ah. 58 rifles in 1967. Almost 68. Nice. After industrial warfare, following the Falcon. Wings above. Oh, it goes to past the Tachanka after we get some infantry tech. There we go. Nice. Nice. Better anti-tank will be bueno.
108 factories, not enough. Modern armored and motorized vehicles has once again changed warfare for Russia. Formerly, our design revolved around building large amounts of cheap tanks to overwhelm the German enemy. While the tank production never reached the amounts needed to truly test this military doctrine, many Germans have supported the idea of simply overwhelming their enemies. However, research into the tank doctrines of Japan and Germany have indicated a focus on mobility and quality. We should strive to learn from their doctrines and, and designs and update our armored and motorized military tactics. Sounds like a good idea. Spend, spend, spend. 5.6 is not bad. Not great. Just not bad. Reinforce discipline. Uh, what do we want? What want? What want? Communes. Empower the communes. I love the PP man. Uh, that's not bad. Even better consumer goods. Uh, that's not bad. Civilian industry. I like that one too. It just, I like that one too much. Probably. I probably really do. Infrastructure's not bad, but nice. One commune. Are you kidding me? Weapons. They can have guns. Camarobo. Funding. Sounds good to me. Tenu Tuva. Tenu what? Nice. Weapons? Alright, I love it. Five to four. The way God intended. Hmm. One, two, three, four, and one. Nice. Industrial warfare is very nice. Pass it to Chonka. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we have 50 more, so let's go do something different. Education? Research facilities? Let's do... Oh, we'll do this one, because we'll get the bonus anyways for now. Very good. And we shall follow it up with a policy of protection because, well, an eye to the world seems like a good thing to do. The Security Council, after deliberating on the issue for some time, has announced a policy of protection. The last thing we need is to anger the likes of Japan or Germany and spark another war to devastate Russia. Should the socialists and anarchists liberate themselves from their oppressors or begin a campaign to do so in their own nation, they will have our full support, but not our weapons. Besides, nothing good can come of intervening in a foreign conflict. Just look at the U.S. It's doubtful they ever expected to be in South Africa as long as they did. Because this one, as much as I want to do this one, I don't want to do export the revolution, global intelligence services, declare a safe harbor. Ah, it hurts our monthly poverty, but reinventing the wheel. It's not rocket science, Alexei, laughed Julia, twirling the wrench in her hands. It's so easy, some old Ukrainian guy could figure it out. Come on, check it out. The woman hopped off the Tachanka too, as Julia called the heap of scrap metal. Alexei shook his head. It's much more complicated than that, Julia. You just don't strap a gun to the back of a vehicle and call it a day. Have you considered stabilization? How far can you go on it? One tank. Julia rolled her eyes, digging through one of the thousands of drawers in her garage. This is serious. You've got two days to finalize this project before you show it up to the Security Council. Or Security Council. Those people don't mess around, Julia. Who knows what they'll do if you waste their time? Julia turned back to face her friend, her lips pursed. Well, unlucky for you, we we're never going to find out. This thing works, okay? I've spent the last six months on it, and frankly, Alexei, if... If it doesn't, I hope Valentine strings me up by my ankles. Mm. It was Alexei's turn to roll his eyes now, not finding the same humor as his friend. Don't believe me? Get in. The young woman slammed the drawer shut with her hips ooh, and retrieved the keys off her wall. Catch! Nearly hitting Alexei square in the face, she tossed the keys to the dumbfounded boy, taking up all the good space in her garage. Julia, come on, this is ridiculous. I mean, Alexei looked, in the, looked at the vehicle, and then to the keys, and then back to his friend. A slight smirk formed in his face. If you say it works... All right. If I'm right, though, I get to tell the Security Council all your secrets so they can torture you. Alexei giggled as he ran to the passenger door. Put her in drive, Alexei. Okay, cool. We get some motorized. It's nice. Oh, and liberals reunify Kazakhstan. Good job. Man, that would be really cool. If we end up with the Siberian Free Territory, end up fighting the Soviet Federation of West Russia. I think it would be kind of cool. Tanks for peace, though. If Russia learned anything from the German invasion two decades ago, it was the utility and efficient brutality of mechanized warfare. Russian troops were cut up and overwhelmed by the speed and explosive power that Panzer divisions had at their disposal. The failure of Bukharin to build a tank force capable of protecting the Soviet Union will not be repeated. Our neighbors have surely come to the same conclusion as us. Developing an armored corps for the Black Army must become a priority if we wish to secure our borders. Dealing with the most prominent enemy. Have you seen what it is to our east, companion Stepanov? Yevgenia bit her lip in restraint. Moments ago, the man had the nerve to tell her that her draft for the international agency was, as he put it, full of spirit, just misguided. He didn't know the first thing about what happens in the Far East, and yet he had the nerve to talk down to her like she was some insolent child. She was ready to tear apart Stepanov limb by limb, but her yet her years of diplomatic expert experience gave her restraint. Our very worst enemies, companion. The White Army, parading around on horses, touting some of some Tsar they've stolen from a faraway land like the previous century never happened. Chairman Yagoda, who I'm sure we are all familiar with. 
based his operations not too far from her initial base in Kansk. Not to mention literal fascists who attempt to spread the Nazi plague from the east. To say we need to focus our attention outwards, Companion Stepanov is an insult to all we are fighting for. We've made significant progress, yes, this is true, but... All we can be ripped away from us at the drop of a shell casing is if we waste our money and resources on fruitless endeavors in America. The Evgenia panted so much for a diplomatic training. Luckily, Yuri interjected before Stepanov could lecture her back. Thank you very much, Yevgenia, and I know I speak for the entire symbol body here when I say that you have put the best interests of the civilian people at the forefront. Fix your problems at home, and then turn abroad. Yeah, how can we, you know, help others across the land if we can't help ourselves? Cool. Uh, mo impl implementing motion, huh? Poverty rate is what? Six? Does it only go by one every time for those those 25 political power costs for this the general assembly stuff? I mean, our... This, okay, we're out of... Okay, never mind. Not bad. Oh, man, we're going to be building a lot of roads now. Loads of roads. Nice. Thanks for peace. And then, an eye to the world. Uh, this hurts our uh, monthly poverty change, but I don't want to lose political power yet, so we're going to wait. Follow the Falcon. Defeating Nervo Sibiris was no simple task. While their army might not have been as strong as ours, their air force certainly outshined ours. We suffered far too many casualties at the hands of enemy air support to ignore the problem anymore. Thankfully, we no longer need to. Nervo Sibiris is home to one of the largest aircraft production plants in all of Russia, and consequently, is also home to one of the largest air fleets in Russia. Additionally, the fleet will be serviced by some of the best plane mechanics in Siberia. The free territory takes another step into modernity. What we can learn. Nothing here makes sense, Yuri Galenskov slammed his fist onto his desk. The document before him so aptly titled an objective analysis of the military state of Novosibirsk made Yuri sick to his stomach. Mishrenko, he could expect this kind of behavior out of, but... Valentif? Would it come over the man that he'd sign off on a report praising Alexander Porkrishkin? Yuri leaned back in his chair in disbelief. Seriously, companion. I should not have to tell you that... This power-hungry, this status, this... Yuri searched his brain for more harsh words, for the general but came up empty-handed. He let us saw a long sigh. I guess I just can't believe this whole thing. The two men in his office shared a look. The two men fought at every turn, yet had settled on this appraisal of what could be adapted from the warlord state of Novosibirsk and applied to a modern, free Novosibirsk. Mishrenko spoke first, looking straightforward and stoic. Companion Galenskov, with all due respect, you don't know the first darn thing about war. Valentin slapped his forehead in frustration. Gosh darn it. Yuri leaned forward, his disbelief rapidly metamorphizing to rage. Excuse me? Companion Galenskov, Valentiev, sheepishly interjected, Yuri, my hate for tyranny burns just as bright as yours. I find their methods sickening and cruel. Valentiev paused, carefully choosing his next words. However, that doesn't mean we can't take something bad and make it good. Porkrishkin was an army man through and through, and as such, he left very detailed notes on his preferred methods of war, specifically pertaining to aerial combat, something we are lacking behind in. Yuri mulled over. Valentiev's explanation. The two military men standing in silence before the hero of the free army. Yuri shot an icy glare at Mishrenko. If we begin to mimic the state, we will be shocked when... Uh, will we be shocked when we become it? Yuri paused. Yet I understand your point of view. You have my green light, now get out. And burn it, too. Hmm. Cool. And uh, hel experimental helicopter designs? Cool. Helicopters are one of the many technological advances made by the world, while Russia regressed into infighting and warlordism. These strange flying devices... Uh, Unlike, are unlike planes of the past in that they use a vertical rotor liftoff system whose benefits include aerial attacks on the ground targets and even transporting troops and supplies to areas where a landing ship is not available. The devices have great potential, as seen from the performance in the South African War, and domestic development should begin, and actually has already begun, and there goes Wales. So already off screen, I've gone ahead and just done more communes, because I have a problem with me just wanting to improve poverty. Like getting rid of poverty is, I guess, apparently one of the things I really like. But we're going to do this one here too, to help us out as well. Because we can. So right now, we currently have probably six still. I want to see if we can at least increase it one more level before we end this campaign, which will be not, maybe in the next episode. I don't know. We'll see what happens. So, ah, good. Keep spending more money. Keep spending. 5.7 is not bad. Not great, but not bad. Cool. And let's keep working on our guns. Please, more guns. Better guns. As we're actually doing fairly okay with our military here. We need more casts. We need more tanks. But what else is new, you know? 
after experimental helicopter designs, we will do Black Wings Above. That Black Army has a little experience with air warfare in the past. Whilst we have used some planes in combat in the past, simply put, we don't have the industrial capacity or skilled airmen needed to operate an air force. Given our size and the relative strength of our enemies, however, we must create and integrate a true air force into our military forces. We have a vast array of former pilots to educate the next generation of, of airmen, somewhat modern designs for airplanes, and the industrial capacity to begin manufacturing said airplanes, a cold cabin. The composer nursed a glass of whiskey on the table. Outside it was a frozen tundra of heck. He never stepped outside, he wouldn't if his life depended on it. He swirled the glass of bitter scotch, fitting for a bitter old man. Kamov offered to fetch him something with taste, but the composer denied him each time. A sickly man rose from a seat in the dining room and dragged himself to the frigid, poorly lit living room. For the living room, it was quite dead. Paint peeled from the walls and books gathered mildew. If one part of the room was alive, there was a grand piano in it, tucked away in the corner as if hiding from the misery that devoured the room. The composer shambled to the bench and sat, his fingers hovering over the keys, his hands descended to play. A knock at the door interrupted him. The composer chuckled to himself. Very fitting. As he hobbled to the door, the man smiled. He wasn't supposed to answer, but he was going to anyways. He could see why these people rebelled all the time. It felt good. Dimitri, said the man at the door. He spoke to him like a child. We know. The confidence struck a chord with the composer, making him grin. You're proud of yourself, then? Just come inside, the old man turned and retreated back into the house, his guest following suit. He pulled out a chair for the stranger and sat in one of his own. Is, it he, is he here? Who? Kamov? You so you know why I'm here? The composer threw back his head and laughed. Of course you came for the helicopter. I don't know why Kamov thought he could hide such a creature. The designs are in the second drawer of his nightstand. Dimitri grabbed the hand of the stranger and poured his soul into his eyes. Do some good, yeah? A thing, five, a hundred things of transport helicopters. I don't think we're actually going to use them, but hey, that's cool. 5.7. Well, we can't increase it too much since... Well, we're kind of running out of room here in our territory. But once we take out the people in the east, we'll do okay. Cool. And military egalitarianism. An army for liberation. Despotism. Okay, focus on attack. AI focus on... An army for self-defense. Oh, I like that too. Military egalitarianism. One of the most outstanding features of the Black Army was its democratic and military structure. Unlike most every other army, power was not derived from the top amongst the generals and highest ranking military leaders, but rather from the lowest soldiers who elected their own officers and promoted those who they thought were best equipped. The generals at the top of the military's command structure are considered no more equal in terms of value than any other man in the military, and it's precisely because of this that our men fight as hard as they do. Cool. Alright, next up we can do some stuff here. We got implementing motion, we got all those PP. Let's see. Scientific research will finally improve that. Academic base. Nice. And we still... I don't mind using this at least once. We could use this 5% more war support, which would be nice. And I don't mind doing this some more. So poverty rate now currently is going up by how much a month? 7 maybe? Hopefully 7? Yep, 7. So it's not too bad. 8 a month for... Wow, agricultural stuff. 2 a month for research facilities, which we're not doing too much with. Academic base is doing pretty well. Disgruntled veterans. It's... It's slowly trying to go up. It's slowly trying to get up there. An army for self-defense. The purpose of our militias have always been to protect, not to harm. The black army is not like the terrorizing force of Yagoda. They fought for domination and power. We fight for peace and bread. Our past conquests should have had little bearing on our future in order to preserve the dignity and integrity of the Siberian black army and the free territory. We must prevent ourselves from falling down the same tyrannical path our predecessors did. And perhaps in doing so, we might find, finally, prosperity. Good. And it's still 67. The system perfected. Companion Nestor bounded his foot in the lobby of the waiting room. Scanning his eyes around the room and finding no one in it, Nestor produced a small dagger from his backpack. He made a small incision into the wall, matching with the other 27. One for each appeal. He found the death of Emperor Puyi sad, but he... He, he, uh, each one for each appeal, he found it a good way to keep track of how many times he had been wronged by the corrupt security council, but also did... Was, was to send a message. People don't tolerate self-serving governments, especially around this part of Russia. He looked up to the clock on the wall. It would be any minute. Nestor, the fair skinny, or skinned secretary, poked her head out from a pair of thick white doors. The assembly will see you now. The assembly? As she misspoke, he booked his appeal meeting with the security council. He was sure. That's the way he had done it 27 times before, at least he thought. They began to blur together after the 10th. She was probably mistaken. The building housings, the buildings housing the security council and the general assembly were merged during the move to Novo Sibirsk. Satisfied with his answer, Nestor rose from his seat with a grunt, pulled open the doors, and walked in. Companion Nestor, if this was a security council, it had gained about a hundred or so members overnight. I hope your wait wasn't too long. Nestor mumbled something, dismissing the, their concern. Well, it looks like you're in for your <clears throat> 27th appeal. Is that right? Nestor nodded his head. Well, your record seems to fit the bill of an officer. You served gallantly against the Red Army in Mongolia and continued to advocate for anarchism since. Nestor was in shock. Not only were they not immediately disregarding him, the people of the General Assembly seemed eager to welcome him aboard. Very well then, I'll open up this body to voting on the promotion of companion Nestor to the rank of officer. The vote is unanimous. Cool. And that's going to... I love civilian factors. I've got a real problem. 
we currently have only 97 and we could probably use a few more military factories so we can build one well once we have space once we have space go figure we're out of space and i also put in orders for oh more civvies and radar and airplanes air bases stuff like that cool actually what do we have here convince oh oh we still gotta convince these guys yeah uh supplies sure that's fine three can be convinced nope refunding sounds good to me uh let's see Re reinforcements we've got plenty of manpower five three four love it now trying to convince everyone else once we get a bigger you know, territory around here it's gonna be more difficult but hey 8.1 percent not bad 50 billion in gdp not bad and eye to the world Russia is a harsh mistress, and her neighbors are even harsher. We need to know what they're doing at all times in order to defend ourselves to do this to that end. We must create some kind of clandestine organization to achieve this end. Should our neighbors begin mobilizing against us, we will know. If our neighbors develop new tanks and aircraft, we will know. If the leader of our neighbor country goes to walk his dog, we will know. With this new agency, the Black Army will have a hand in every folder and an eye on every single nation. Yes, please. Cool. Let's grab some better guns, too. Or better improvements for our guns. 8.1% 8, 8 not bad. Not great, but not bad. 7, not good enough. But then we shall declare a safe harbor. The world has become a harsh place. Across the world, individuals are being persecuted for race, religion, ideology, you name it. The free territory isn't like that. We are one of the few nations on earth that can profess to be truly free. We must open our borders to the world and become the safe harbor of the world. So as long as you do not intend to cause harm or havoc within our borders, you are welcome to join our grand experiment. Additionally, immigration has its own benefits for us as well. The more numerous we are, the better we can protect ourselves. Very true. And boost. Cut. Nice. Oh, ah, we have an agency now. A safe hob up. Do we get any sort of event that maybe, maybe not? Convincing stuff. Uh, probably hire foreign instructors. That'd probably be pretty good to do. We lose some political power, but whatever. Oh, yeah, we do get 15 army XP. That's nice. Cool. Oh, anti tank. Nice. Uh, we get that one too. Cool. We're really trying to improve our army here. So. Solidarity with the world. Building a spy agency is no simple task. It requires time and patience to build something so large and important and secret. Decisions to be made, directions to take. For example, defensive intelligence organizations are often operated and structured differently than more aggressive intelligence services. A focus on long-term infiltration and surveillance may be more important than foreign in instigation and smuggling. Neither choice is poor, just a different way in which to allocate your resources. We will have different effects depending on our policy. Journey to the East. Cool. We should actually keep an eye on what they're doing over there in the east. And I forgot, yes, we need this one too. Basic anti-tank. Better, better, better. And since we've got this, we want to do this too, right? Passive defense, something like that, probably. That makes sense since we are fairly defense-minded right now, so. 5.5 billion. Solidarity with the world. And we're almost done with this part of the focus tree. Cool, so we're done with that. We did all this. I don't want to disregard the Siberian plant. It's so nice to have, though. The greatest story never told. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. It is now 1968. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this is... This, ha this opens this happens okay, usually on every campaign, I think, so... Cool. So that's done. Uh, I guess we have to reach for Don finally. Uh, uh. Rigid economic planning both restricts the rights of our citizens and harms our economy long term. If we truly wish to see Russia prosper and the glory of the commun communism prevail, we must abandon these authoritarian ideals of controlling the economy through the state. Bukharin tried and failed. If we wish to see true prosperity, we must allow workers, organizations, and unions to decide for themselves what to produce as a natural reaction to the needs and demands of society and the economy. While some decry such a system as capitalism under another name, we reject such a title. This is a true socialist economy. Oh, we get to minus 42% consumer goods. We have that currently, but... Oh, man, that's painful. Journey to the East. Got everything you need? Yegor buttoned his jacket all the way up to his chin. You look like an inflated balloon, sneered Rush Ruslan, swinging the backpack over his back. Oh, hilarious. I rattled off all the things you looked like, but the worst thing you look like is yourself, jabbed back Yegor. If you're going to do this whole mission, I'm just going to push you into the nearest snowflake snowbank I can find. That won't be hard. Chita isn't exactly a tropical paradise this time of year. Yegor grabbed his things and made for the door. We're not going to be relaxing that much either. You know what the... You know, they've got real tsars out there. That kind of people we've got to sabotage. They've already sabotaged themselves by clinging onto that dead ideology. Off we go to defend anarchy. Tartuos agency, nice. Very cool. And let's grab an operative. Yelena Yazarov, uh, promotion cost tough. I like the tough leaders. Nice. And actually, what do we have down here? Encourage land, escalate land reforms. It's not bad. Just, mm, I want to do more, but. Mm, 
This one's not bad, but we don't really need that. Probably the communes might as well. Alright, two communes supporting it. Military training, that's fine. Krasnoyarsk. Political autonomy. Uh, that's fine. Kamarobo. Supplies, I can have it. And boom, we got it again. Let's see, 5.22. Not bad. We have about 24 army XP, 40 combat width. These tanks are 20 combat width, which will improve. Actually, you know what? Just throw on these guys. It, it, it only makes sense to put those guys on there. Uh, let's see. And then you guys. I'll throw one more artillery and then one more infantry. 20 combat width. Not bad. How many tanks are we missing now? 188. Not great. Still not bad, though. Uh, basic APCs, we can probably lower that by two, maybe. Start working on some more casts. Independence. Nice. We do have some planes around here as well, so. Please don't tell me we remove this. Please don't tell me we remove this. Minus 42% consumer goods is so good. Okay, is it, is it still here? All right, so there's no national focus we can do, and we have to wait until 1949, 49, no, 69, before we can do anything else. So I think for now, off screen, I'm just going to get through things a little bit ahead of time, do more of this stuff, improve party rate, improve everything else, just because there's not really much here. If something comes up, I will make sure to show to you guys. All right, so we are not that far ahead, but the workers' territory. I don't know how to run a factory, Aliyev. Normal people don't know these things. The woman slapped her hands on her sides in exasperation. She loved Aliyev. He was her first and only love, but God did he get on her nerves. Spending 20 years with a man would do that to a person. Her husband only scoffed, setting his notes from the assembly on the dinner table. He shook his head as he walked to the room, kicking off his shoes by the door. She peered over from the side of the table she was sitting at and scanned over the notes. Did Yuri really say that? I mean, Aliyev, you understand that this is not a victory for us, right? You've got a kid and a half. She rubbed her enlarged stomach. The thought of her husband being responsible for the house was one issue. Running an entire workers' co-op fit to challenge the industrial might of the East and West was an impossibility. Aliyev rounded the corner, back into the kitchen, his tie dangling loosely around his neck. The Siberian plan was a disaster, Anastasia. I know you are smart enough to recognize that. It trampled workers' rights in the name of security. Security which, for the record, never came. I just mean, look where we are now. Anastasia massaged her forehead. Why was her husband such a brute? Not everything was an ideological struggle. Sometimes the politics of a decision mattered much less than the pragmatic effects. Aliyev, you're going to have two kids rampaging throughout this house. I can't do this alone. I understand this means everything to you. It means so much to me. But not everything is a battle. She stood and walked to her partner, planting a kiss on his cheek. Aliyev <clears throat> digested the message, debating it within his head. Anastasia, my love, you know I would do anything for you. I want a better world for our children. That's all I want. His spouse sighed and returned to her seat. Fine, she thought. But if this blows up, she reserved the right to tease him about it. Forwards together. So, party rate goes up. Decreased construction speed um, somewhat. We get go to partial mobilization, which we lose political power, factory output, and civilian factory construction speed goes down. Um, honestly, nothing else has really happened. I mean, it's supporting communes here. It's March 4th. I mean, like I said, it's not, not, oh, not much has really happened here, but uh, that sucks. But like I said, it's a beer plan. Uh, it's still not bad. We still have minus 42% consumer goods, so pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Little files burn the brightest. Bright orange, that's the color of love. Some will tell you it's a dark, passionate red. Others will tell you it's a deep blue to rival the darkest trenches of the ocean. Love is not a rainbow of colors but from the years spent learning, crying their eyes out, and screaming at the top of their lungs. Love is not a collection of experiences. Love is a spark, a wild and angry creature that thrashes around in a person's heart the moment they see someone. The one. In that intense moment of first meeting, the brain is hijacked, all senses thrown to the wayside. Who needs senses anyways? <clears throat> Love is pain, a battered and broken creature that has suffered too long inside your stomach. It yearns for freedom and for a miracle to escape from its cage, yet it remains dormant in docile love. Love is a broken promise, a jealous and bitter creature tired of putting up with non-existent BS. It rips, op it rips open its chest and pulls out its beating heart and demands its partner shatter it to the ground and turn away as its pieces scatter into the wind. Love is forgiveness, a remorseful and pitiful creature which clogs up the organs of the body with saris, pushing them up the throat with all their might. Love is, in, in, is an instant. A moment of connection between two people that sets them on the course for the rest of their lives. They might think they know love, but one doesn't feel it until the moment it makes itself known. Above all else, love is victorious. In which, okay, so this happens from earlier, like, about having to either get this happen faster, or, let's see, social normality. Uh, this, like, either, like, with despotism, we can enforce people to accept this, or we just give it time to slowly be integrated, so... Kind of wonder, it just randomly appeared up all of a sudden, so. Cool, right now it is December 21st, 1968. We're close enough to 1969 that we're just going to keep going on. We have some support for social democracy, uh, despotism, of course, and, of course, libertarian so Soviet socialism and stuff. So, we're developing civilian, civilian industry some more. We've got 124 civilian factories. I've run out of things to build, so we're building a lot of air bases here. We're building a lot of anti-air. <laughs> and we're building a lot of, ra ra literally, radar stations in every single state because we are maxed out. 
We need more room here. But cold days, unfortunately going by the recent actions, it seems that all hope of peace with the Far Eastern Imperial Realm have been dashed. An announcement from the Cheetah. The Far Eastern state has claimed that they were an illegitimate state that stands in their way on the path to reunify all of Russia. Following this dec declaration of hostility, they have expelled all of our citizens within their borders. As the military starts to mobilize and cloud circle the horizon, it seems that a conflict of interest shall be settled on the battlefield rather than at the negotiating table. Quite worrying. And, of course, civilian industry. Let's see. Uh, go on and just start stacking all this stuff up. I don't even re really care about reading this stuff, so... Now, let's get some more military factories because we can use it anyways. Develop the Siberian Railways. Very, very nice. Um, and we've already finished all this up, which is actually pretty good as well. We might want to keep some of this political power, though, just so that we can just core stuff as fast as possible. Because we have developed, like, really, really fast coring stuff, so... Oh, the black dress. The wedding. The long plan and looking forward to by most of the attendants was, as befitting the territory of the Black Army... There goes Scotland. Oh, come on, Britannia. Stop it. An, anarch an Antarctic affair. The brides arrived first, both on leave from the militias of the respective communes, and both wearing matching black dresses emblazoned with the army's sigil. sigil. Modifications ordered to allow them to comfortably sling their rifles have been expertly integrated. The priest arrived second, his clerical uniform stained and, and submachine gun scuffed from the day's entrenchment training. And the guests arrived third, each forming up behind the commune's bride and bearing the marks of their own daily militia activity. Oh boy. Although the communes agreed on the need for a collective action against enemies without, in truth, there was much tension between them, put aside only enough to ensure that the special moment for their respective daughters was not interrupted. In short order, the priests officiated, and the brides exchanged vows, both to the black army and to each other, before sealing them with a kiss. Cheers quickly turned to cheers, however, as with the ceremony itself now completed, and the alcohol brought forward, long-standing disputes emerged once again. One guest swung at another from the other commune, who responded by dislocating his arm. The priest struck a reveler with a thrown bottle, knocking him flat. A general brawl followed, though all were careful not to use their weapons. After all, they were, after all, allies in anarchism. As one bride broke the nose of her new wife's cousin, she laughed in delight before helping him to his feet, knowing that they would fight together against their communal enemies for many years to come. A strange wedding indeed. Very strange. Very strange. Um, we could spend stuff. I'm done spending stuff for now. Uh, that's probably not a good idea to do that one right now. That's okay, though. Uh, just because we don't need any more debt. I mean, I, I'm literally, we're literally maxed out right now on like building so once we get these guys under us the far eastern republic that'd be really really great or <gasps> whoa oh boy oh boy it's glenn it's the i've not seen the ai i think i, I don't think i've seen the AI do this yet oh that's awesome oh that's so good I, rfk wasn't assassinated either i think so yeah i didn't get any event for him so nice very nice 2.2 billion ain't bad but yeah, we're going to just save a lot of PP up. Never mind. Higher foreign instructors is good. Uh, it raises additional forces. That's fine. We got to get to the... They actually might go to war with us first, actually. Uh, how strong are they? Ooh, I don't want to do this though. Actually, where are we at for this? So we also got primary schooling for this. I'll do the research facilities. Modern agriculture already, which is really great. So we're done with pretty much agriculture for now. Poverty rate is still going up by 14.5 a month. I know we could get as high as we possibly could. Uh, we haven't done too much for industrial equipment, as well as industrial expertise. And disgruntled veterans... Industrial, industrial base. Not bad. I want to save the political power, but... Mm, mm, okay, one more time. Just one more time. Zero. Supporting us. Can be convinced. Nope. Chris Norris, request weapons. Sure thing. Kimarobo, request weapons. Sure thing. Tenor 2 request reinforcements. Sure thing. They require military training. Sure thing. Four and reinforcements. Sure thing. Nice. Now we have 137 civilian factories. Not bad. It's five comments are supporting us. Four are opposing. And reunification of Russia, prepare for war. Uh, I guess we might as well. If you want to read about the little event here that happens every time, Grand Showdown, it doesn't really matter. They actually probably go to war with us. So let's take a look here and see. Mikhail, an evil Tsarist. We have doubles manpower, and we have, oh, decrease the poverty again. If you like to read about this, please go right ahead. Nice. They have up to 20 divisions. We have 37, oh, no, 27, not 37, 27 divisions. And I've been training a lot of planes too, so. Well, some planes. Not bad. Both guys have, or both wings have 200 uh, thingamabobs. Let's do that one. And then we'll begin the invasion soon. A conflict of interest. Stepanov tore the jacket off of himself. It was too darn hot in this room. A sentence seldom said in Siberia. He removed the cap from his head, smoothing his few remaining hairs over. He observed himself in the mirror, adjacent to the entrance of his dhaka. He grabbed the fat on his fat, pulling at it. He dropped his shoulders. He was getting far too old for this. How long had he been fighting? How long had he been acting? How long was he going to wait? The general shook. 
uh, the thoughts from his head. It was a long game worth playing. Nobody ever rushed to power state in. As he walked to the bathroom, he let out a groan. His knees were giving out on him. Two little years spent charging into battle, and far too many spent planning them. Ivan turned on the faucet, still hung up on the conundrum that had plagued him for years. On the other hand, those who had waited for power did not get it get long to enjoy it. Stepanov cupped the cool water in his hands and brought it to his face. Three knocks came from the door. Stepanov sighed, letting his head lean against the wall. What could it be now? Begrudgingly, Stepanov returned to the door and answered it, but stood before him exactly what he pictured, a scruffy kid. Was it so much to ask for just people to act like people? What do you need? Good evening, companion Galanskov. I apologize for my tardiness. I just enlisted. I came out from the east, getting myself acquainted. Stepanov raised an eyebrow to the man. He knew naivety. He could see it from kilometers away, taste it in the air. He loved it. The crew let out a nervous chuckle to fill the awkward silence. I had a message for you from companion Valentin. He told me to tell you that he... He would have radioed it in himself, but the only one broke but their only one broke in the middle of their expedition. They've orders to go to Tartarsk, but they've orders to go to Lesobersk. That's what I told Valentiv, Stepanov interjected. I'm very tired, it's late. You have your orders, run along now. Stepanov quickly saw the door on the soldier's face. Well he thought maybe it would pay off all in the end. The long game is the one with the largest prize. Oh boy. Uh oh. That's not good. And we lost all the political power, god dang it. And we have less Horse now. The shot heard around the world. I trust you retrieve the information I requested. Marco just returned from Novosibirsk, from civilization, finally back to the cold and somber wilderness. He was honored to be chosen to serve under companion Valentine, even the frozen huts of the far east. He had heard the stories. Valentine was uncompro uncompromising, but passionate, not just bitter like the a-holes where he came from. He fought for what he believed in. That was something Marco could look up to in a commander. He was not only willing, but eager to lay down his life for Valentine to his, for his commune. God, it felt so good just to have a purpose. Marco did not see combat, however. He saw his companion set up tents as he climbed into the truck. He never met companion Galenskov, but his name was unavoidable. When Dmitri gave him the address of the commander of the Black Army, he felt giddy to meet companion Galenskov, but he found him irritable. Of course, companion Valentiv, we are under orders from uh, companion Galenskov to go straight to Lezo Sibirsk. Valentiv froze his brow. Seriously? That's what he said? Well then. Stepanov took the goggles from his forehead and pulled them down over his face. Let's go. Arriving in the commune of Lesso Sibirsk, Marco could immediately sense something was amiss. The way people poured out of their horses, houses, standing outside and just staring. Valentin was visibly uncomfortable. He spoke to one of the members of the commune, something Marco couldn't really hear. He tried to claw his way to the front of the pack to stand next to companion Valentin. Why had they sent so many people? By the time he reached his commander, there was shouting. Whomever Valentin was speaking to had drawn his weapon. The people on the front lines holstering, holstered weapons of all kinds as well. Shotguns, rocks, bottles, whatever. Valentin began to back away, but the crowd was too rowdy. Someone in the crowd of black army soldiers, or from the commune, fired. Mark no knew he had to act and charge forward, slamming Valentin to the ground. It all falls down. Uh-oh. Oh boy. Oh boy, what's going on? The joys of fine dining. The room seemed as if it were alive. Men threw their heads back in laughter and hysterics at jokes that only friends would understand. Candles adorned the shelves of the walls, giving the room a golden glow, sat and nestled awkwardly between the antiques and knickknacks that occupied the space the other 364 days of the year. The beating heart of the room was found in the center, a wall of men surrounding him, hanging on, uh, onto his every word. Yuri Galinskov's booming voice was unmistakable. So I have killed Chichikov standing beside me, reeks like a dead deer and alcohol. I'm trying to not puke up th that morning's food, although it would look the same as it did when I ate it when it all came out. Am I right? I know you've seen that stuff. Anyways, he's trying to tell me that he says, Yuri, I think I hit a deer on the way here. And I turn to him and he say, Keep in mind he thinks of death itself. And I say, Oh no, that was just Mr. Renko wandering out of the mental facility again. The table exploded into laughter, save for the man at the head of the table whose mind was fixated on the drink before him. Suddenly the door to the tavern threw itself open. Companions, companions, where's Yuri? Galenskov pushed his chair back and stood, his demeanor quickly shifting from jovial to serious. What is it? I'm here. I don't know, I don't know, I just, I was just out hunting and northwards, you know? I saw the Black Army. They were just all in this massive formation in the city square. I didn't think much of it and continued on my way, but I heard shots and men started falling. As the exhausted man struggled to catch his breath, Yuri turned to his ally, stepping up, hoping for solidarity, but found the man unbothered, smiling as he sipped his drink. What were you saying, Yuri? Uh-oh. This, this does not sound very good for some people. Hey, but I like this. Bed and desk equipment. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead once again. We get factory complexes. Nice. We get 1.42 every day. Not bad. Improved anti-air. Oh, we actually had to divert. Oh, I, I don't like that one a lot. Just because it literally takes up slots uh, of factories that we really don't have. So, wait, wait. Mm, there we go. There we go. Go five. Go one. Go five up here because we're going to need it. Go to three for now, too. Improved anti-tank is pretty hard to make. That's okay. We don't need that much more support companies probably anyway, so... Convince people. No, we're good. We're done convincing people. We got a look at that manpower. When we don't cut down military uh, expenditures, holy crap. Hey, we have a tank division too. Nice. Um, For now, 
I'm just going to put... Uh, I don't really want to put him in there. I really don't want to. What do we have? Mikhail looks pretty cool. Chilchichkov. Iberia Balchers in council, huh? Well, let's see. Well, I'll give him Andrei Mishurenko just because he's old, he's battered, and he's got a lot of attack. Stepan Valentiv. Chapyayev. Hello, Chapyayev. You're not that great, but whatever. He's an offensive dude, so... Oh, we don't have enough command power. He will be an offensive dude. Uh, what do we have down here? We need more command power. Like, investment construction. I mean, that's okay and stuff. At least we're getting more PP for now. That's nice. But hey, we may see, make a tank division. I think that's great. Nice. Very nice. It's 69. Nice. Have, hope you guys are having a great year. And we're still going to be building a lot of anti-air. Look at this. Every single place has <laughs> radar. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, this Siberian plan is very, very strong. Holy crap. All right. Come on. Let's go to war. Let's go to war. Come on. Far Eastern Republic. Uh, you can cut the spending. It's fine. No choice. Uh, we're going to leave it there. We're gonna... <gasps> we actually have this? Okay, cut it. Anyways. Oh, my goodness. We actually have a depth. We have money to spend. We actually can get liquid reserves with 8.8% total GDP. Uh, we're on the horizon. The troops of the Far Eastern Imperial Realm are beginning to mass at our borders, with their fortified bunkers and military operations at their display. Their intentions are clear. War will face our nation, and we must mobilize our troops quickly, if we do not wish to be overwhelmed at the front. Their forces shall test our mettle, but we know better. We shall break their will first, and our nation will triumph in the lands of the Russia. Winner takes all. Look at that peepee we've got. Good lord. Um, this will slightly decrease scoring time. I don't mind that, but doing agricultural stuff means nothing, so I'm not going to do that one. Uh, machinery. We can actually probably do that one. That's still okay to do. Uh, and over here... Mm. I'm going poverty. I don't care what happens. I'm going straight poverty. Maybe I live in poverty. Hmm. Let's see. So it's 6.5. Western Siberian Republic. Oh, huh, West Siberian Republic. Cool. 6.5 a month. We might not be able to get any higher, but that's all right. Oh, we need to convince people too, probably. Two. Let's go with military training. Nice. Let's go with political autonomy. Sure. Kimarovo, political autonomy. Fine. And we have five versus four. Nice. 40 combo with infantry. Well, we're getting closer to it. So close that we can almost taste it. Beautiful, my friends. We'll put those guys on the line when uh, we finish the war against these guys. I hope we can do well against these guys. They have up to 19 divisions. They haven't played 10. We're not sure how many they have. Oh, I forgot to do this, too. Gosh darn it. Nice. It's almost 1970. Actually, we could probably do some light aircraft. Yeah, we definitely need to do that one. Holy crap. Guys, please, let's go to war. Oh, let's go to war, go to war, go to war, go to war. Oh, we can't do that yet. Wait. Okay, they go to war with us. That, that's good, because for some reason we can't go to war with them. All right. Wait, our current preparedness is 0%. That might be a little bug in the game, actually. I'm pretty sure we should have it higher than that, but... Mm, that's... 21, eh. Wait, hold on. Oh, the Irkutsk hydroelectric station captured. The city of Irkutsk, recently taken by our Siberian armies. The mighty hydroelectric stations come under our control. Constructed under orders of the Yigenrik Yagoda after the Soviet Union was pushed back to the corners of Siberia. This work of infrastructure has reliably generated energy for the entire city under its command. A mighty symbol of the Russian mastery over nature, the Irkutsk hydroelectric power station may also be a symbol of our control over the eastern Siberian frontiers amidst the chaos of warlordism in the east. Given the immense amounts of electricity gathered from the currents of the river, we can utilize the potential of the hydroelectric station to send power to our many Manufacturing plants, factories, and homes of civilians or citizens living within our territory. The concrete station towered over the Siberian waste and churned through great amounts of the Angara's water to generate electricity. We will utilize the natural veins of our fractured nation, and with such a magnificent source of electricity in the region, our energy supplies will never run dry. This will surely aid our efforts. God, God. You know what? We're going to build anti air all over the place, too. Um, we can't build any more stuff. I'm more interested in building territory here, so building construction in Oman. We could do. Uh, we could do stuff down here, but how's the war looking actually right now? We lost uh, less than, we've killed off quite a few. How's the plane situation? Looking pretty good. Pretty darn good. 60 billion GDP, 40, 28 billion in terms of debt. Alright, could be worse. Oh, do you guys not have, you guys should have orders, right? No, Alright, not bad. Land reform, no. Uh, power workers organizations, huh? Tokyo standoff, cool. Nice. People killing each other, but what else is new? It's the world. I would assume that those guys are going to win the war, so... 
Iberian Wars, very nice. Uh, we're losing quite a few guys now. 8,000 versus 32,000. They have up to 22 divisions, which is not good. Come on, guys. Let's punch a hole through. The formation of the Sock Intern, a step towards the free world. Alright. Manpower wise, they have 90,000. Uh, we're losing quite a few guys. Hmm. Maybe we should stop the general attack. I mean, the guys are only 20 combat width, but still. I, how much equipment do they have? Well, they don't look like they got a lot. No, they're completely out. So any attack we do, they can't replace. So uh, I don't like doing it like this, but we'll do it anyways. Worker training. Uh, bonus industry. I'm going to grab that one just because that's really, really good to grab. So when we hit 1970 soon, we'll have extended research, we'll say. Extended research. Just move in there, guys. Go. Yvonne Stepanov. Anything here? No. Anything we should be aware of? No. Anything we should be aware of? Yes. Good. Yes, your espionage. Passive defense. Keep going, guys. You're doing a good job. A really good job. In some places. We've lost 24,000 versus 74,000. Wow. That's a lot of dead guys. We like it like that. Oh, good, good, good. Actually, how's the land doctor? Did we finish that already? We did. Nice. Artillery. Let's get some better artillery. We want to hit them a little harder. I've not done artillery at all so far. Can you guys actually help out? Is there anyone else we can help use here? Um... Come on, guys. Keep going at it. You're doing a great job. Uh, nothing there. <laughs> I don't care what it takes. Come Rogel. Alright, so be it. Only 144 civilian factories. Oh, the F Soviet Federation of Western Russia offered Sok intern associate status. An invitation has arrived from the Soviet Federation of Western Russia, inviting a ruling party into the Socialist International as an associate member. This new organization, often shorted to the Sok intern, is meant to bring together all those who fight for the rights of workers and the advancement of mankind towards socialism. Our parties received an invitation of associate membership. This position would allow us to observe the organization's meetings, and perhaps in the future join it fully. The Western Russians await our reply as their decision concerning joining the Sok intern or not. Uh... They are hardcore authoritarians. We don't like them, but maybe we can convince them. Maybe we can convince them. We'll see what happens. Uh, for now, go and keep slashing that. There you go. Spend more for now. We want more attack. Passive defense is nice. Ah, the airbase captured. After a bloody, particularly bloody siege, your men have captured Cheryumushki airbase from the cowardly enemy and pillaged the facilities of any retrievable plunder. With most of the airbase left intact after the siege, we find that the field may be soon be put into purpose, re sooner rather than later. The aircraft that sits in the hangars sulk, their metal wings still and unused. With an entire airbase now under our control, our territories can now support the squadrons of planes tearing across the ashen Siberian skies. With the airfield as an asset in our favor, our men may advance through the Siberian wastes, knowing full well that pilots watch over them from the skies. The cold is east, the east is cold, and her winds are colder, but no such show could render our determination to clash and fly. Our, the skies are ours. Good, good, good. Get down there. Beat them up. We lost 50,000? Roughly 50,000. They lost 111,000. Holy crap. Now, once we core these people, like, we're going to have so much. So much manpower, hopefully. Cultists, fascists, and reds. 21 divisions left. And 32,000 manpower. 40 factories. They can't match us. They're done. They're pretty much good as dead. They're going to try valiantly to not give up, but it's all going to be not for the end. Infantry leader, uh, would you guys like to move in, maybe? Can you guys win over here, maybe? Maybe, maybe not. Yes? No? Maybe so? Cool. There it goes, Egypt. Now we're missing tanks, anti- well, anti-air, we, we were always missing that, so. Other than that, we're doing really well. Look how much artillery we have. we got to save that for, like, we make our guys 40 combat with, so. It is what it is. Nice. How many more dead men do you want, Mikhail? 180,000 dead. Well, over 200,000 dead, really, because of how much you hate Russia. Agency infiltration, nice. Cryptographic engineering, good. Mm, infrastructure, power workers, organizations. Eh, meh. We already have maxed out agriculture, so it doesn't even matter. Socialist International. Collective, 1,500 million, huh? 
Oh, look at that. ComCon. Eligible non-members. Join them. The Socialist International. Huh. I would love to see that we could peacefully reunify with us leading it, but I don't think that's going to happen. Probably really there to go. I want that one. We've lost 60,000 versus over a quarter million. Not bad, not bad. Our guys have done well. It's been incredibly bloody because I'm, I'm a little lazy here. I didn't want to manually do it like this, but, you know, whatever. 16 guys... Or 16 divisions, not bad. Force them. I don't want to do it, but force them. Force them to die. And there'd be a way to do it there, too. Cool. Another tank division. Nice. Uh, everyone's like, but, oh, Ludmilla? Why not? Very nice, very nice. And you know what? I will send you over. Just to help lower their entrenchment a little bit. That'd be good. Education? We can do education a little bit. Why not? I'm not seeing anything else here for, like, army professionalism, so we'll wait. Let's get even more artillery now. Better artillery. 300,000 are dead. Mikhail, look at what you caused. Look at literally what you caused. How many dead Russians do you want? How are they not dead yet? Like, seriously. 95% of the way there. Port of Magadan captured. As their troops rushed past the far eastern borders and frontiers, their assault on enemy lands was halted only by the sea. The Great Pacific opened wide and made our men, after bloody battles, the Port of Magadan had come under our control. The icy and choppy waters stretched for miles in every direction in front of them. The mysterious stretch of Siberian waters was a home to by far the most significant port in the eastern Russian wastes. A hub of trade and smuggling, with a particular taste for Japanese and American goods, the Port of Magadan opens up greater opportunities for our administration to not only trade wares, but also make a name for ourselves across the globe. Indeed, with this valuable port under our control, we pray to see our foot in the door to international recognition and trade. The gateway to Russia has been secured, and now we can focus this direction. Now, it looks like... Actually, who's winning here? Is West Siberia winning? Huh. Interesting. But, let's... Oh, sweep eastwards? Eh, that's kind of done already. Region development? Well, I'd love to do that stuff, but... Really no point to now. And... Well, we need 50 more political power, and Siberian reunification... Might as well, right? And we can begin to exert influence in the Caucasus, because those guys are too busy down there doing anything, which is great. And we can do military intervention, and let's get some free dockyards. I love it. And what do we have? Do we have a focus tree yet? No. Ah, what can't be reclaimed? The Security Council was seldom as packed as it was. One would imagine that with the sheer amount of people, the room ali was alive with voices. Before you, I have made copies of Memorandum 91703. This message relayed from Mr. Galanskov. You'll stop right there, Ivan. I've given far too much to sit here and have you badger me. You have no idea how men... People of this territory, I hope you have been paying attention. I had said nothing against Mr. Galanskov, and yet he is already prepared to blow his top. Don't BS me. I know exactly what this is. Galanskov bellowed from his seat. Sipping off, carried on. Undisturbed. The message before you never got to companion Valentiv. So Valentiv sends a messenger. Mr. Galanskov tells the messenger that Valentiv is required in Lesobesibirsk. He repeats this multiple times. They must go to Lesobesibirsk. And so they do. While there, fighting broke out between the local population and the confused regiment. Eight dead, countless wounded. The room was silent, but it looks but if looks could talk, the room would be unbearably loud. Galanskov held his head high, eye level of the people, his brothers and sisters who had come out in droves to support him. He reminded himself to not look at the seemingly Increasing number of soldiers in the room as well. Before us, we have a hot-headed child, not someone that fit to lead us in the greatest struggle we will ever face. I cannot, in good faith, allow Mr. Galanskov to guide the most important of battles. I beg this body to put the people first and remove Mr. Galanskov immediately. The members of the Security Council shared nervous glances between each other, and there's not one people, as Stepanov referred to. The free territory had instead split between two increasingly threatening camps, the people and the army. The people demand freedom, and you offer them a dictatorship, Mr. Stepanov. Uh-oh. 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 Terrorists attacking early. We offer no quota. Hot Ottomans. It's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. That's what how the phrase goes. It's supposed to be inspirational. It's supposed to give a lazy bum the kick in the back to do what they were always afraid of. Stepanov wasn't quite sure if he was afraid of the people. There was no confusion. He certainly didn't like them, but he was but was he afraid of them? Did he hate them? That question was more nuanced, and certainly not the one General Ivan Stepanov pictured he'd be thinking as men and women alike kicked at his ribs. He couldn't hear much. Maybe because his head had been savagely beaten, but maybe because he didn't want to. Stepanov's built his head like a fortress, locking himself in and others out. For decades, that was how he lived, a constant inner monologue with himself, planning his eventual assault from the fortress. The moment he let the drawbridge down and charge is the moment his castle crumbled. 
He had waited so long, put up with so much compassion, or companion, and this stateless that. Who cared? He did, certainly didn't. All that preparation, all to hear the Security Council utter those simple words. Yet, the only thing Stepanov heard were the chants of the raging crowd before him. Stepanov, the general, died in the Security Council. Stepanov, the schemer, died as the people saw through his act. Stepanov, the bloody and broken, would die at their hands. Galenskov was saying something, of course he was, but Stepanov didn't care to listen. He chose to watch as his men anxiously hovered over their hands over their guns, looking at each other for support. Shoot, he screamed at them through his eyes. Do something. He felt the rope slither around his neck. His eyes softened a command to a plea. A plea to scream, and the scream did do nothing. All that scheming... For nothing. And here we are, my friends, with the final part of the focus tree. More drastic measures. A second test? A more drastic measures. It is increasingly becoming obvious that if we wish to survive in the bleak world, we must acquire nuclear weapons. The free territory is a mighty land, and our people are full of heart and courage. But no amount of courage weapons or men will stop a barrage of nuclear weapons. Their, their terrible strength is unparalleled, and only the strongest nations currently possess them. The only way to ensure such weapons are never used against us is to match theirs with our own. If we can manage that, we will have to secure the independence and safety of our communes. Leave this to the experts. All hands on deck. Oh, we know which way we're going to go. But... I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow, in which we may end this campaign. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.